In this episode of the Soul Method Podcast, we do have some adult language. So if you have little ones around, grab your headphones now. Hi, this is Joelle Fawcett, and welcome to episode two of the Soul Method Podcast. Life is a winding road, no telling where it goes, driving through days and nights. Won't Hi, I am so glad you're here. Welcome back to episode two. And this episode is titled The First Time I Cursed Out My Coach. And as you can imagine, based on that title, it would certainly not be the last time. I mentioned in episode one that right when I had my breakdown moment in the spring three years ago in March, two amazing women came into my life. One of them was my life coach. When I first arrived in her office, I was honestly a complete hot mess. Part of me really didn't want to be there. However, If you know me at all, you know that I am incredibly stubborn, and I knew at that point that I really needed help. So as much as I didn't want to be there, the persistent part of me marched up those stone steps and into my appointment. At that point, I had recently left the business that my husband at the time and I had been building for the past eight years, and shortly after that, I had left the church that we had been attending for about four or five years at that point. I'm not really sure what I was expecting to happen when I did this, but I wasn't expecting to lose most of the friends and connections that I had in those places. I felt so completely alone. Because I had so radically shifted, my husband at the time looked at me like he didn't know who I was, and our marriage was falling apart. I was crushed that he didn't seem to understand what I was going through and was really upset with the choices that I had made. All in all, I was a complete head case. I also came to that office very well armed with all of the reasons as to why I was a victim in these circumstances. I knew that I was right. The problem was that Despite my belief in my rightness, I also knew that I couldn't see myself out of it all. I needed help. So, all of that being said, there I was, nervous as a bird, perched on the edge of a cushion for the first time in my coach's office. Little did I know that this would be the beginning of one of the most amazing journeys of my life. The first area that my coach tackled with me was personal responsibility. Personal responsibility is the number one foundational principle of the soul method. So, what is personal responsibility? Or even just responsibility? Wherever you are, whether you're driving or working out or just lounging around, think for a minute. How would you define responsibility? What does it actually mean to be a responsible person? Now, as somebody who's been around the block with self-help conferences, I've heard so many inspirational speakers get up on stage and say, responsibility means the ability to respond. And the audience goes, oh, like they've had their minds blown. Honestly, I think this definition is too vague. With what ability? How much do you need? I grew up being taught that to be a responsible person was to do the, quote, right things. I mentioned this in the last episode. People who weren't responsible were the people who didn't pay their bills or vote. In my mind, being this type of responsible person was synonymous with being a good person. To be a responsible student, meant to obey the rules, do my homework, get to class on time, you know, all the things. And to be a responsible family member was to do my chores on weekends and subscribe to what my parents told me was right and wrong. Does this sound familiar to anyone? 
Now, I actually looked up responsibility in the dictionary, and according to Webster, responsibility is defined as the quality or state of being responsible, such as moral, legal, or mental accountability, also reliability and trustworthiness. Okay, does this make sense to anybody? My question still remains, accountable to who? Moral, on what terms? I'm calling bullshit. Our culture has fed us a false definition of responsibility. One of the first times I had an awareness that my definition of responsibility might be inaccurate was about 10 years ago. At that time, I had the privilege of meeting Jocko Willink and Leif Babin. These two men are now retired Navy SEAL team officers who were a part of the Battle of Ramadi in Iraq that happened in 2006. For those of you who have seen the movie American Sniper, they were officers on that same team. Coming out of their careers in the military, they've written several books on the lessons they learned on the battlefield and how, in the Battle of Ramadi, their team was able to make headway in a situation where many other teams hadn't been able to gain ground. A bit of background. When they were in Ramadi, it was the epicenter of the insurgency in Iraq. The first book they wrote is titled Extreme Ownership. When I met them, they talked about how extreme ownership is the principle of taking ownership of everything in your life, and how on the battlefield, that mentality had infiltrated every member of their SEAL team. There was no pointing fingers, no victim mentality. Each member of their team owned everything of their position. And with that mentality, they both built trust, and they were an integral part of winning the Battle of Ramadi. When I heard them speak, I was in awe by both the power of their words and humbled by their sacrifice. I've never forgotten that afternoon. And after working with my coach for several years, the civilian version of this is how I define responsibility in my own life. For the purposes of the soul method, we will define responsibility as personal ownership. In more detail, this looks like intentionally co-creating every aspect of your life with the universe, or, you know, whatever word you want to use, universe, spirit, God, that thing out there, it doesn't matter. Pick a name. To actualize and express your most authentic self. I'm going to say it again. Personal responsibility is intentionally co-creating every aspect of your life with the universe to actualize and express your most authentic self. Now, most of the time when I say this, there's always one person listening who goes, but what about those crazy people out there who believe their most authentic self is doing harm to other people? What about Hitler? So this brings us to foundational principle number two of the soul method, which is everyone's most aligned expression of him or herself is based in love and freedom. Here's the simple fact, folks. Only hurting people hurt other people. We will tackle love and freedom in another episode, but for now, suffice it to say that while love and freedom are not the same thing, it is impossible to live in a state of one without the other. Now, back to my coach's office. I came to her terrified of being responsible for my life. I was completely resistant to this concept, and my ego was freaking out at the thought. For those of you who don't know what that means when I say my ego was freaking out, what I mean is that little voice in my head that never stopped talking, you probably know. Think of that little voice in your head and make it say hello right now. That thing that just keeps talking, that's your ego. Your ego is responsible for your pride, your defensiveness, and is usually very resistant to taking personal responsibility. 
Right now, you may be listening and be just as resistant as I was. After all, if I was responsible for everything in my life, wouldn't that mean that everything was my fault? That my failing marriage, my completely screwed up finances, that every failure in my life I would somehow have to atone for? I argued with my coach at this point. I said to her, there really just are things, though, that aren't my fault. Things that just happened, and now I have to deal with them. I had several explanations as to why I was a victim to my present circumstances, and I was very ready to prove how I was right. Maybe you can relate to where I was. When you think about the people who have wronged you in your life or done you harm, maybe your parents, a teacher, an ex-boyfriend or girlfriend, or even yourself, could you explain to me every reason as to why you are right to feel abused or victimized by this person? I bet you could tell me in detail as to why the breakup has forced you to mistrust men or why you can't go to that bar anymore. How, because your wife is a jealous person, you're not allowed to have female friends. Or why, because your husband left you, you're unable to live a happy life. Maybe because you made a mistake one time, several years ago, you'll never be able to forgive yourself. Okay, so this is the part of the podcast where I should warn you. All those topics that are really uncomfortable, maybe even ticked you off, I'm going there. So if you're not ready, that's okay. Just go ahead and pause the audio for now. Moving on. Trust me, I really get it. The reality is that it is far easier to stay in a state of victimhood and codependence than to take personal responsibility. When you're in the state of victimhood, you get to blame everybody else and everything else in your life for why you are where you are. Now, when my coach said this to me, I goffed at her. No, it is not easier to stay like this. I am fucking miserable. I hate my life. I wake up every day and I don't even want to show up for my kids. Patiently, she had looked at me with kind eyes. Okay, she said. Tell me about why you have to stay like this. I told her all the reasons. I told her how my husband was checked out and working all the time. He didn't understand me. He didn't support me. He left me alone with the kids. He wouldn't accept the fact that I wanted to change my spiritual beliefs or step away from the business. And he didn't do anything to make me feel loved. It was his fault. She nodded slowly and smiled. Got it, she said. I continued. I want to change. I really want to fix the way I feel. I just don't know how. She took a deep breath and smiled. Well, it's very simple, she said. You need to take back personal responsibility. I shook my head, confused. What do you mean? You've made your husband completely responsible for every emotion in your relationship. You've made it his responsibility to make you feel loved, worthy, and at peace. And that's a lot of power to give to someone who never asked for it. It isn't his fault that you're here. It's your choice. I stared at her for one long moment. Fuck. What the actual goddammit fuck? So there's been a few moments in my journey where the truth has hit me over the head like a sledgehammer. This was absolutely one of those moments. Now, at this point, my coach softened up and explained to me about codependence and how, because that is the type of relationship I had built with my husband, I can never feel free or truly loved. A lot of people define codependence in many different ways. I've heard people talk about it as the need to be in a relationship, 
the need to be around people or even just throw the term around. Like, she's so codependent without really even knowing what it means. Here's the fact. Our Western culture glorifies codependency. We see it in movies, especially those that show romantic relationships. We hear it in song lyrics, and we are often taught it by our parents and teachers. Like I mentioned in my last video, we are molded at an early age to abandon our inner knowing and instead look to our society to tell us what is right and wrong and what we must do to be loved and accepted. Now, a part of this is the fact that we are tribal creatures by nature. Homo sapiens as a species has survived by banding together in groups over centuries, as we are clearly not the most vicious animal on the planet when we stand as individuals. To the point where this has allowed us to thrive as a species, this communal mindset has been essential. But let's be honest. Very few of us are living in this type of situation today. Our survival is far less based on food and shelter and more on whether or not the internet is down. However, our native instinct to look for trust, love, and acceptance in our tribe hasn't changed. In fact, it's been completely warped to proportions that are unhealthy and leave people wondering, like I did, what happened? Codependence, as defined for the soul method, is the state where you need anything or anyone outside of yourself to be a certain way or do a certain thing so you can feel fill in the blank. When I was in my coach's office that day, she showed me how over the past nine years of marriage, I'd needed my husband at the time to say certain things and do certain things so I would feel loved. For those of you who are thinking, but that's normal. I'm here to tell you that unless you want to live a very frustrated life, it's not. Other examples of codependence from my own life include how, as a young adult, I'd needed my parents to get along so I could feel peaceful. I'd needed my peers to include me so I felt worthy. And I'd needed my boss to approve of my work so I felt that I'd done a good job. Can you identify with any of these sorts of needs in your own life? Do you need your partner to text you back with it a certain amount of time, or else you start to feel ignored? Do you need a coworker to just stop talking so you can feel settled? Do you need your kids to respect you so you feel validated as a parent? Do you see some people as toxic? Do you dislike dating because you feel like you can never be yourself in a relationship? There's an amazing book called The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle, and in it he writes, A victim identity is the belief that the past is more powerful than the present, which is the opposite of the truth. It is the belief that other people and what they did to you is responsible for who you are now, for your emotional pain, or your inability to be your true self. This victim identity is synonymous with codependence. If you can relate to any of the things that I'm saying, don't beat yourself up. As someone who's been doing this work for several years, I am constantly recentering myself and breaking codependent habits that like to try to reinsert themselves in my relationships. Codependency does not favor men or women, young or old, it is prevalent across all genders, all ages, and all people. If you're not sure, think about when you're often frustrated, anxious, or irritated. When do you start to feel off with your partner? When do you start to shut down at work? When do you roll your eyes at your kids? Most often, when we are feeling this way, it is a sign that we are letting our egos run the show and acting in codependency. Honestly, this is a terrifying state to live in because underneath of codependency is the firm belief that you need to change or control someone else in order to feel peace and love. It's an impossible situation 
because the reality is that we cannot control other people. Even our kids, as many of you other parents can attest to. I've come to believe that living in the state of codependence is actually living in hell on earth. When you place your sense of alignment outside of yourself, it is impossible to trust or love yourself, and you will constantly be searching for that trust and love in every relationship you have, romantic or not. So, as I was sitting in my coach's office that day and the truth bomb hit me upside the face, I realized that I was actually responsible for the state of my marriage and, in fact, my life. My coach explained to me that the way out of codependency is through personal responsibility, and only responsibility could lead me to a life of true peace and personal freedom. The only way to solve a problem is to take ownership of it, and the only way to transform a part of your life is to engage with it. You cannot engage if you do not take responsibility. The truth is, if you aren't responsible for your life, who is? Most often, the world will just take control. And the world's statistics on success, relationships, and happiness, they kind of suck. Now, I want to make clear that taking responsibility is not the same thing as beating yourself over the back with a whip and sobbing in mea culpa for all the faults you have done in your life. As committed as our culture is to the tradition of Anglo-Saxon suffering, I do not subscribe to such a thing. Fault and shame are not a part of personal responsibility, so if you're going there, take a breath for a moment. Fault and shame come out of the belief system that there is wrong and right, and that to be a good person, you must do the right things according to what your culture or religion says. When you believe you've done wrong, you feel at fault, and shame or guilt starts to creep in. This brings us to the third foundational principle of the soul method, and one I have a feeling will generate a bit of a reaction. Principle number three. Right and wrong do not exist. Yes, you heard me. Right and wrong do not exist. Instead of right and wrong, I subscribe to the belief that love and freedom are always the foundation of every person's best self. And in realizing that, we can all live fulfilling and successful lives. The soul method is built on this. We will talk more about right and wrong and these belief systems in another episode, I promise. But if you have questions for me now, definitely reach out. That first meeting with my coach was the start of a several-year journey that still continues to this day. The truth bomb was the first step in me taking personal responsibility for my life. While mentally I had started to understand that concept, it would take several months to emotionally release the fear and trauma around loving myself, trusting myself, and, most of all, being with myself. Mental understanding is not the same thing as living out of a place of understanding. For example, you can understand the concept of what ice cream may taste like. Someone can describe it to you in perfect detail. But until you actually taste it? Would you say you've ever really experienced it? That is the difference that I'm talking about. There are a lot of concepts I'll cover in this podcast, and mentally you may have an understanding of them. However, if you stop there, nothing in your life will change. I encourage you to apply these concepts to your own life and do some real soul searching to begin to truly experience the difference they can make. Now. As we wrap up this episode, I would really love to hear from you. What are your takeaways from this episode? What questions do you have? Can you relate to my story at all? Or are you cursing me out at this point? Email me at joelle at thesoulmethod.com or comment on the Facebook page. If you'd like to work with me one-on-one, -on -one, definitely let me know. I can't wait to hear from you. Life is a winding road 
No telling where it goes. Driving through days and nights. Won't stop for traffic.